So uh, Janet Anderson received a master's in library and information science from Indiana University. She currently serves as the Northwest Clinical Campus Librarian for the University of North Dakota. Janet has held a variety of roles within libraries. She began her career in Virginia as a children's librarian. She then moved to Indiana, serving in multiple roles in both public and academic libraries. In 2012, Janet moved back to North Dakota to become the adult services librarian at the Minot Public Library and eventually served as the director of the Minot Public Library for eight years. Janet is here today to share her knowledge and experience with Bedbegs while she was the director of the public library. Uh, library. Um, and without any ado, if you have any questions, you can definitely put it in chat or we, we there will be times to ask questions throughout. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Janet. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, uh, for taking some time today to hear about this interesting, not always um, pleasant topic, but I hope to be able to shed some light um, provide you with some practical information as well as some reassurance. Um, as David mentioned, I just recently made a switch from the public library sector. So when I first presented this presentation, it was as the library director for the Minot Public Library. And three months ago, I transitioned into um, medical and health sciences. So I have made some minor revisions, but for the most part, this comes primarily from my time as the public director. So first things first, um, questions that I hope we'll be able to answer today is first of all, why this became an issue and why I suddenly became an expert, as well as some definitions about what is a bed bug, what's needed uh, before a problem is identified, as well as how you can identify and what steps to take once the once you have decided or determined that you have a problem. However, first things very first is I need to make sure that people are aware that there will be a lot of discussion about some creepy crawlies and that if you are a little squeamish, there may be some photos that you are, are not going to enjoy. So for that, I apologize, but I do think it's necessary. I also want to mention though that there is no relationship between bed bugs and cleanliness. And just because a person or a household has bed bugs, it does not mean that they are unclean. Further, keep in mind that bed bugs do not cause any known illnesses and they are unlikely to live or thrive for very long in library materials. It's also unlikely that they would reproduce in library materials. These last three items I can tell you came directly from our local public health district officer who I spoke to once we identified there were some issues. And then lastly, the photos shown are enlarged for presentation purposes. So, how did the public library get here? We had had some previous minor issues with some assisted living or apartment complexes that we delivered to. The Minot Public Library has a healthy um, homebound delivery program, and it is very common in some of these type of complexes that the bugs will tend to spread. So in those instances, we simply told the patrons to keep the items until their problem was addressed by their facility management. And then once we went and picked up the items, we made sure that they were well sealed and then we quarantined them in an exterior shed for a while. However, in 2022, a patron notified us that they had a bed bug infestation. So what we did is we put a temporary block on that patron's account, meaning that they just couldn't check anything else out until they had gotten the problem fixed. And then the items that they returned were again sealed and quarantined. Later in that same year, not long after this, we found items that had some suspicious bugs in them. And with that, we did take those to our local public health district and they were identified as bed bugs. Once that situation occurred, we assumed the patron was not aware of it. And we informed them that, that we had discovered this and that we were going to quarantine their items and 
asked them to take care of the situation, hoping it was a one-off. Unfortunately, with that situation, this patron did, again, return items later with more items that were um, found to have live bed bugs. So this patron's account was blocked and they received notification that their account would be blocked until we had some sort of confirmation that the issue had been contained. One of the very useful resources I found was the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Services, and they note specifically that small numbers of bed bugs spotted in schools, libraries, offices, etc., necessitate action, but do not usually warrant closure or cessation of operations. We all have people who maybe tend to um, catastrophize small events, and I hope to not do that with this presentation. I hope to be able to show you that this is something that unfortunately happens, but fortunately can be managed. So first things first, what is a bed bug? Bed bugs are small, very, very small. They feed on the blood of animals, primarily humans, although occasionally other animals. Um, they've existed since ancient times. Bed bugs are mentioned in medieval European texts, classical Greek writings, Aristotle depicted them in 1485. So they have long been a nuisance to, to humans including back in 1869 in the Hall's Journal of Health, there was a very lovely blurb published that indicated a housekeeper who, who took care of her specific um, beds to make sure that no bed bugs were ever, uh, were ever found. The interesting thing about this from 1869, though we do not usually have beds made of feather or hair anymore, this method is still not a bad method, uh, which is just to thoroughly brush out all areas and expose them to some of the elements. A little bit later, actually, in 1876, there was a a debate about whether or not bed bugs may actually have some medical um, benefits. And one writer declared that a dilution of bed bugs, either to the 12th or the 6th, might even help with fevers. So this I will let you try on your own if you would like to. But I, I have to agree with the editorial concept um, that we confess we can see nothing very extraordinary in such demonstrations consequent on swallowing a bed bug. So not advisable. All right, so here is probably the first of the bad photos. The bed bug is really only about 3 16th of an inch long. It's usually reddish brown. It's oval and sort of flat. It's very often compared to an apple seed, but it's actually a little bit closer in size to a lentil. A lot of people have a hard time identifying these, not just because they are so small, but they're often mistaken for ticks or beetles or um, lice. And one of the main differences that you will find in these, especially compared to ticks, is that they don't really have the pincers or um, the, the appendages that a tick might have. And again, you're not going to really be able to see this unless you have a magnifying glass um, or are using some sort of microscope, which is how we had our local health district identify it. Um, bed bugs do not fly or jump like fleas, but they can crawl rather rapidly. And that's how they tend to get around and get from materials. Please note on this slide also that the actual size of a bed bug is very, very tiny. So as a library, no matter what type of library or any sort of public entity, what do you need? The main thing you need is a policy that's approved by your governing body and a clear procedure for staff. 
this was something that at the time the Minot Public Library did not have a policy. We did have a policy related to damaged materials, but this didn't quite meet that. And then staff need a very clear procedure to know how you're going to handle it. However, the last thing that I will add is that you need compassion. There is a very, uh, very good article, which I have included in my resources, that talks about, I believe it's 2022, the impact that a bed bug infestation can have on assisted living homes. And a lot of this does happen in group homes. So we're looking at people who may not have the funds to do the complete extermination that would be recommended, who may not have the physical ability to pack up and move all of their items. And even if they do, it's a huge inconvenience. I've known personally people who have had this issue at apartment complexes. And in general, they just go through the stigma of feeling like they are dirty, they uh, are never going to be clean again, they're never going to get rid of these. So please try to have some compassion. Related to the first two, a policy and procedure, some considerations you want to take to keep in mind is what is going to happen to the items, meaning what is going to happen to them immediately and then later. Secondly, how is the patron account impacted? What's going to happen to other items checked out to that same household, or if it is an assisted or group living home to that place? And then how are you going to treat the items? However, I want to caution you, and this was a very excellent point made by some of my colleagues as well as my board, is that it is helpful to have this policy and procedure in place, but before you go spending a ton of money, please consider, is this a problem that you expect to deal with frequently? We immediately leapt to various solutions, including buying special heating ovens and um, creating a quarantine space, and we realized maybe we could take some smaller steps rather than spending a lot of money and a lot of time doing something that would really only be needed maybe once a year. We were very um, unusually that we had it twice in one year, but this was not something that we needed to jump overboard for. So what to do? The first thing, that you need to do, and the hardest thing is going to be identifying the bed bugs. As I said, they're very, very small. Most of these photos here are provided from um, another great resource put out by Cornell University called Guidelines for Prevention and Management of Bed Bugs in Shelters and Group Living Facilities. Um, the photo with the paper clip actually comes from Visual DX, and as you can tell, it is pretty greatly magnified. So this is the most difficult part. In general, the best approach is going to be a better safe than sorry approach, which means look at everything as though it could potentially be an example of a bed bug or some other type of infestation. Again, without leaping to throwing everything away, it's still best to maybe set aside something. So in the lower left-hand corner, you can barely see uh, there's something inside the tab that's of a dictionary um, next to that. And this is a common place in physical um, items and furnishings is inside screws of chairs, desks, that kind of thing. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see some comparisons there. So the top right, we've got a poppy seed. Next to that, we have a newly hatched bed bug. And next to that is an apple seed. So again, we're looking at something very, very small. Other ways to identify if you have a problem is to look for kind of proof of this. So that could be stains from bed bug fecal droppings, which can be little black specks. And those of you who work in a public library know that 
books come back dirty. And unfortunately, sometimes it may even be hard to tell the difference between a dropping like this and a pencil or pen mark. It is helpful to have a magnifying glass and to be able to see if it's something you can wipe away or erase. Um, adult bed bugs, as shown in that bottom photo, also can be very thin and can kind of, that's how they get into different homes and different locations. Again, apologies for the photos, but it's also important to know that they look different compared on or depending on whether or not they have fed or after feeding. Generally, if you're looking at it in library materials, you're probably more looking at that clearish color. Um, so during feeding, obviously, they um, are not quite as dark. After feeding, they're going to be a much darker color. If they haven't fed for a while, they're more of a tan color and as would be their shells if they were, um, if you were to look for proof of previous existence. Again, I'm not going to go too much into the medical side of this. However, it should be known um, that different people react differently to these bites. Um, it's commonly usually called cluster feeding, what they would call breakfast, lunch, dinner. So you're going to see kind of three, three bites in a row, but they can range from very faint to extremely red. And that is all based on a person's internal reaction. Some people have a greater reaction to mosquito bites, just as they would to these types of bites. And so it may not be uh, something you need to concern yourself with too much, but if you yourself were ever concerned, um, it, it would be worth probably a discussion with a healthcare provider. So now to the really difficult part. What do they look like in books? Well, they, they can look like anything from this first photo on the bottom left, which shows the, basically this was a squished bed bug. So this is like the carcass of a bed bug, um, which shows you there isn't a live bug in there, but at some point there was. Um, the middle photo there, this is droppings or excrement of bed bugs throughout. And then the one on the right is a close up of that. So, if your library is like my public library was, those first two photos, that's not terribly uncommon to see something like that. Books get put in the bottom of bags, they get dirt, they get crumbs. So it's just worth taking a little bit extra precaution, maybe wiping down the books. If you, I think it's a really good idea to in, invest in a magnifying glass uh, to maybe take a close look, especially if you start to see them repeatedly in the same returns from patrons. So once you are to the point where you're going to create a policy and some procedures, the one thing I learned and I found from other libraries is that it's important to consider having an approach to confirmed instances of bed bugs as opposed to suspected instances. The main impact or the main difference with this is going to be the impact of the patron's account. We worked really hard to try not to punish people because we suspected there might be an issue, but at the same time when it was confirmed we did not want this to spread beyond one patron and on to others. So Ultimately, what the Minot Public Library developed was an infestation policy and procedure. And this document is several pages long and it includes two different tactics. So you have a tactic for processing obviously damaged books. And again, we, we decided to make this a infestation policy in case there were other bugs. You could always um, bed bugs are going to be the most common that you find in library materials, but 
it is possible to be fleas or termites, very, very unlikely, but we thought we would not restrict ourselves to that one type. So of course we have a whole procedure on what we will do with the books themselves, how they'll be made unavailable to the public, but still um, be within our holdings, obviously. But then we get to the impact on the patron status. So we want to, if it's temporarily suspended, um, we, we try to use, again, that as much compassion as possible, but we would also include other members of a household. And if it was in an assisted living facility, we would contact that facility. But we'll get to how to handle these books and everything a little bit more. We also made sure to include in our letters to the patrons that they could contact our local health unit. So in this policy, we have sample letters that we would send on the first occurrence. And we just basically said, we're going to evaluate this. Um, if anything else is returned with evidence of bugs, then we will have to suspend the privileges until you can help us prove that this has been taken care of. And then the next letter shows that we have found actual evidence. Now, in the instance of the Minot Public Library, we opted to make the extra step to, do, to phone the patron as well. So they weren't just receiving a letter, which could take days to get to them. We would call them first and let them know that this letter was on its way and what happened and provide them the information. On a side note, I will be very honest and tell you that those people are not usually happy to get that information and they may very much be in denial and they may be angry, but that is not a reflection on you. And I think if we were given that information, we would probably also have um, maybe some denial as well as some embarrassment. So we, again, compassion, compassion, compassion. So, you think it's a bed bug. Now what? First thing is to isolate. So, we would contain the affected items and any items potentially affected. So, if items were returned in the book drop, we would contain everything in the book drop. If they all came from the same household, we would contain everything. And when I say contain, what our public library did was we would put them in two bags, preferably sealed. So preferably like a large Ziploc type bag. But if it had to just be a grocery sack, then we would tie that up really tight. And then we would put it in a sealed um, box, like a storage tote, and we would place it in an outdoor shed. So after the items were isolated, then we want to contain any potential spread. So if they were returned in the book drop, we uh, would wipe, we would vacuum down the, the book drop because there was a cloth interior. We would wipe it down. Um, we would examine other books that may have been near it. Um, and then we would just follow the procedure. So the photo here is actually a photo. We found most of our problems were with DVDs. Um, and so this was a photo I took when we had a large collection of DVDs returned from one of the households that had been identified. And so we didn't find many live bugs, but we found a lot of these kind of shells or carcasses in the DVDs. A note I would give is to consider designating a different location for further inspection or confirmation. So we didn't expect our frontline staff to get out a magnifying glass and really start looking. If they found something unusual, they bagged it, they boxed it, they set it aside, and then an assigned staff member would take that box outdoors and then usually inspect it with another colleague at the time to determine, okay, is this actually what, what we think it is? Um, 
Now, uh, the last and, and the hardest thing to consider is getting rid of these suckers. And that was not actually intended as a pun, but I suppose it is. Um, the bad news is that bed, bug, bed bugs can live a really long time. We're talking months and months without feeding, especially in cool kind of tepid temperatures. Um, now, I'm in North Dakota. We have a lot of time with below freezing temperatures. Um, but an example of this I'll show you is that we placed some suspected items in quarantine on August 31st and then went back almost a month later and there were still live bed bugs in those items. So they had been contained in the bag, in a container, outdoors, in a hot shed, and they were still living. So that is just something that we have to face. It is not gonna be easy to get rid of these. And that's another reason why it is difficult for people who experience this. The good news though, is that bed bugs don't want to live in library materials. They are not gonna feed in library materials, so they're not gonna reproduce in library materials. Um, so what you're really hoping to do is squash them while you can so they don't move on to one of your patrons or worse, possibly one of your staff um, homes where they would likely thrive. So there's two primary options for treating bed bugs. The first is heat. And various reports um, will give you various numbers, but these seem to be the most consistent. If you can get the items in 106 degrees for 100 minutes, you're going to kill them. As you inch up that temperature, the time gets smaller and smaller. And I mentioned earlier we had considered we have another public library here in our town and they were having the same problem. And we considered purchasing um, these specialized ovens, which are almost like a big insulated um, cooler, but instead it does the opposite. But they were hundreds and hundreds of dollars. There were some that were thousands of dollars. Um, and we just decided maybe we won't do that. So we looked into steam, which is very effective. It doesn't really matter the type of steamer. Um, but again, when you're talking about books, you don't generally want steam or humidity on them. So we opted for books to go with cold. Um, so below, keeping items below freezing, anywhere from five days to a month should extinguish the, the bed bugs. Again, in some ways, we're very fortunate that we here in North Dakota can go several weeks with below freezing temperatures. Um, but what we opted to do instead was to place items in a, um, like a stand-up freezer. Um, the other option, which is less, less confirmation, less research to show is that you could quarantine the items in a container for about four months and they would just eventually die off from not feeding. Unfortunately, pesticides have not been proven to be very effective at all. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend sinking a lot of money into that. However, it could be useful for helping around the area, and if nothing else, it might just provide additional reassurance to you and to your staff, who will probably be a little concerned. These next two slides I will not go into, I promise, but this is just a little more detail about different ways to deal with these, especially if it's not just in books. One thing I will say is that in the last year, I have become the de facto bed bug expert. <coughs> Excuse me. And ironically, at the 2022 North Dakota Library Association, I presented this um, presentation to my colleagues, and it just so happened that the hotel we were at came down with bed bugs and some of the um, some of my colleagues, unfortunately, had to deal with this, and they were essentially told, oh, you have to throw all your stuff away, you can't bring it home with you, 
methods. And that is not true. That is absolutely not true. There are methods. Yes, you want to bag everything as best as you can and as quickly as you can, but you do not need to throw everything away. Vacuuming is going to be very, very helpful. And going back to the 1800s, brushing things out, so using a vacuum with a brush, especially to get in crevices, is going to help dislodge things. So one thing is you want to kind of vacuum repeatedly if this is in, say, a home. So you vacuum above, and then the, the bugs or the eggs may fall. Make sure to vacuum again below. And then empty your your vacuum canister quickly and tightly. If you have a bag vacuum, that's great. If not, empty it into a bag and take it outdoors. So, <coughs> apologize. The main takeaway is that this is a huge pain. This is really annoying and people are going to kind of freak out, but it's not the end of the world. There are definitely ways that you can manage this and that you can do so while keeping your library safe and keeping your patrons happy. Um, finally, I still do not know that I am an expert in any way on this, but these are some fabulous resources that I found. Um, the last one, number 11, when the bed bugs come, that's another problem. That's the one I mentioned earlier that it's especially, it's, it's a little heart-wrenching to hear about some of the people's experiences in low-income housing. Um, I also got a lot of information from the North Dakota State Library's LibGuide, which linked me to a lot of this information, and then also just some regular um, sites that we're going to use every day, CDC, um, EPA, all of these are going to provide you a lot of information, um, some guidelines, some reassurance, and again, reach out to your local public health unit if you can. And with that, I hope I haven't grossed anyone out too much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Janet. Um, if anybody has questions, you can uh, either uh, type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. We're happy to take questions and answers. Uh, that's what this time is for, so we can have some interactions here. So if you have any questions, please feel free. If not, I can. I have a couple that I can ask, but we'll give people a minute or two to uh, consider what they may have in their repertoire. Hi, um, I'm Chris Barnes, uh, Customer Service Manager for Spokane County Library District. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, I, I believe I heard you say that if you suspect an infestation at a facility, that you send a letter to the facility to let them know. Uh, and would you also do that if if you if you had a customer who had an infestation and they lived in an apartment complex, would you send a letter to the apartment complex or would you leave that to the customer to reach out to the apartment manager for spraying and whatnot? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Thank you for the question, Chris. Yes, um, that is, a really good question, and I'll start with the second half of that, which is we talked about the apartment issue, and ultimately were a little concerned that that was maybe more of a privacy issue um, because these were individual patrons. Uh, so we opted to leave that on the patron to let them know. Um, however, I'm pulling up the Minot Public Library's policy because there was a section that's specifically for our homebound patrons. So when we enter into an agreement with a homebound patron, we're entering it into with that facility. So um, in that case, we would have the person in charge of the program of our homebound delivery 
reach out to the patron as well as the site facility. Most of the time when we found that this was an issue, the site was maybe already aware or had recently become aware at the same time as us. Um, so we would contact the, the contact person we have there, um, let them know this is what we found, this was the, the resident, um, because they would have a list of all the residents we delivered to and tell them what our procedure was. And then usually they were really good about getting back to us and letting us know um, when they had, they would usually have a company come in and, and spray or not really spray, they would come in and do like some different treatments. Hope that answered your question. Thank you. All right, we have a couple of uh, questions in the chat here that we can go through. Um, one was, how often were the, are your infestations uh, that you had at the Minot Public Library? Um, I was with the Minot Public Library for 10 years, and I want to say it only happened four or five times. Um, in 2022 were the only times that I at least that we were aware of and, and caught, where it was individual patrons. Every other time it was at an assisted living location and they usually notified us first. So this is where we had to kind of take that caution and think, is this worth all of the extra effort and money that we are going through? Um, if this is something that only happens twice every five years. Um, another one is who, who was in the development of the policies and procedures, HR facilities, et cetera, uh, when you were developing those procedures? That's a really good question. We, um, at the public library, we had a staff appointed committee that was our policy and procedure committee. So it included um, representatives from various internal departments like our children's department team, um, admin and adult services. We were separate from our city's human resources. So I acted as basically the human resources liaison. Um, and then we did ask for input from our facilities. Um, but they really the main thing that we got from them was we identified a space um, from our facilities team. And then once we came up with the proposal, of course, we brought it to our library board who reviewed it in depth and made some minor recommendations, mostly related to the patron impact, and then approved it. Thank you. Um, so the next one we have, were, were any staff concerned about customers visiting the library and bringing in bed bugs on their, pe on their person? Yes. Um, yes, and, and I think rightfully so. Um, but I, I think part of that came down to a little bit of an overreaction once you, you learn, oh my gosh, you have bed bugs. Well, in both the cases of the individual patrons, they did not come into the facility. They returned their items in the book drop. Um, so we didn't have too much concern about furnishings or anything like that. We did take we did up our, our cleaning for once we had been notified about one of them of some of our public seating areas, but we also had upped our cleaning game during COVID to the point where we much more thoroughly wiped down our books and we just continued doing that and then continued inspecting books even more. So yes, people were concerned, um, but those concerns were not validated in the end, and we tried to reassure them. Thank you. Uh, next one. I know our library has a contract with someone who brings in a dog that sniffs for bed bugs every month or so. Do you know about how these services work or how effective they are? Um, that is actually a really interesting, and I would love to speak with this person more and say, um, one of the resources I used did have that um, service, 
but I did just in my recent readings um, learn that it's anywhere from a 40 to 60 percent accuracy with the dogs um, sniffing. So I think, I think that's a really good option. Basically, the bed bugs give off like a certain carbon dioxide odor that dogs can detect, which is interesting. And there's also a similar way you can lure them um, with into like a small space by using the same kind of scent. However, a recent study that I think was in the it may have been in the steam treatment um, study I have cited here, um, showed that the, unfortunately the dog sniffing um, experts were maybe not the highest um, validity. Thank you. Um, next one, thank you for an informative presentation. I've seen great variation in treatment recommendations. For example, clothing in a dryer on high for a minimum 45 minutes versus 10 to 20 minutes. Do you have any recommendations for determining best practices? I wish I could say yes. Um, I, I would honestly follow um, the CDC and EPA guidelines as very, very basic. Um, the, try to go back to where I have the nitty gritty, um, most of this information here, which talks about garments and furnishings and things like this, um, it's from a bit, it's from an older guideline, um, put out by Cornell, but I have found that most of the information I've found since has reconfirmed this. I think in general, if you're told on high for 10 minutes or an hour, as long as it's not going to damage anything, I would always err on the side of doing more than less. Okay. Um, next question is, I'm working to develop my library's policies. Would it be possible to view your policies and letters to help develop our own policies and the links? How would you handle finding bed bugs in the library itself? Um, yes, absolutely. I'm happy to share this and I can um, work with David, however, um, to get this information out. I know that the slides are there, but I can include that policy. Um, honestly, if I, I think what was ultimately decided when there was some concern about finding bed bugs in the library was that we would hire um, experts to come in and and treat the area. Um, it's a little unclear. Some, some of the experts suggest, so we had, for instance, a four-floor library. Some would recommend treating the entire area just to be safe, whereas others would recommend just treating the immediate area. Again, I would tend to probably over um, treat rather than under treat. And it seems that in the case of it happening within a building, you're mostly going to be looking at furniture. So um, in that case, it's a lot of vacuuming and steam treatment of furnishings. And then there is some pesticides that are used. Um, again, it's usually the, the heat treatment that is, is most most reliable. Um, we have two questions related to homebound staff. Um, uh, and I'll sort of combine it together is, uh, do your homebound staff take extra effort to inspect and wipe down the books? Um, and or and did you request your, uh, your homebound staff to help make your recommendations and policies? Yes, to both of those. So we had um, one staff person who is in charge of arranging and choosing and setting up. And then it was volunteers who delivered. And that, just as a side note, became a whole other issue. We didn't want our volunteers to be put in these uh, situations. So when we knew there was a situation, a location that had this, um, we would usually send a staff member then 
to pick up the items to make sure that they were, um, so we, even after we had proof that the situation had been taken care of, we would ask that the items be bagged um, at the very least. And so we would have staff who would go and pick these up then rather than volunteers so that if they weren't bagged, the staff would be a little more confident in saying, no, we're not going to take these, please do this. Um, and so the person in charge of this homebound, homebound delivery was key in helping us determine this. This person also happened to be the same staff member who dealt with damaged materials. So they had almost double um, impact on this. They would be the person in general who inspects items to determine whether or not we would charge for damage. So they were key in having part of our policy and procedure committee. And then as far as inspections for these types of books, so they get brought, they are delivered and returned in canvas bags. And then the canvas bags are um, set aside. And then that person is the one who goes through them. So again, being that they were in charge of that program, but also they oversaw our damaged materials, they paid special attention to checking all the cracks and checking in the spines and beneath the dust jackets. Thanks. Um, we got a couple more here. So if one of your customers experiences experienced an infestation and there are other family members in the household, do you block all their cards? Does everyone get a letter? How exactly did you handle situations like that? Yes, um, if it was a family, it was the same household, we would block all of their accounts and send a letter to the household. Our ILS system allowed us to search patrons by address, so we were able to um, send out basically an itemized list of these are all the items checked out to your household. Um, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say... I guess, which items, but we would say these people have items checked out. Please don't return them um, in the book drop. Please do this. So yes, we would uh, prevent the, the household from, from checking out further items until it was taken care of. All right. Um, next question. Uh, would it be beneficial to have educational programs indirectly related to an outbreak and our resources available for patrons regarding this uh, and where to find help, et cetera? I think it would be extremely helpful. Yes, I, I think, again, it was something that we saw all sides of it. We saw people who were like, oh, it's no big deal. I don't need to let anyone know to people who were in complete denial, like, I, that's not me, I'm not dirty, why would I have that? Um, and I learned a lot from talking to people in public health and learning a lot about that. So I think, yes, I, I don't think that's really my place to do it, but I think if you were thinking about doing that for your own library, for your own community, it would be an excellent resource to, to, to provide. I imagine that a lot of assisted living homes have that sort of training, but it would be good for individual residents to know this information as well. I see Kelly, you came on to the uh, thing. You can definitely ask your question, feel free. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for offering this. My second question was, I know we're discussing bed bugs, but what about fleas and other bugs like fleas and then lice for those who are working in like a public setting or um, are there policies also set up for those bugs? And then um, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm also a homebound one where I check the bag. And that's being mailed. So there's already a delay for the patrons, and they are very nervous, and they want their items checked in. You quarantine yours. So how do you, the lapse of time, and the, I know we're very lenient on any kind of fines or anything like that, but you have people upset because you're quarantining them, or do you go ahead and manually take the material off your record? or? 
Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I did the majority of the research um, into the different infestations. Um, and so I will say I did not dive deep into fleas, lice, cockroaches, um, that kind of thing. It did come up in some of the research. And so our infestation policy is called that for that reason. Um, I think with mice, our children's library um, has some, some more experience with that, perhaps, yeah. Um, and so they didn't, you wouldn't see that so much in materials. Um, same thing with fleas. Again, in most cases, you're going to be finding like evidence of having them because they don't live in that situation. They're a little bit bigger. Um, so I, I guess the, the answer is sort of we have um, a policy in place, but we may need to consider different tactics. Um, as far as the quarantine, that's such a good question. So, like I, I, the patron side of it, I totally get, and we did have patrons who were like, this is still on my account and why am I? So we created a quarantine class and we would just take it off their account and put it into quarantine. Um, so it was basically like a patron called quarantine. Um, so we would know who the last person was who had it, but it wasn't showing on their account. And then if people were waiting for that item, which did happen, um, we would just simply have to call them and say, we've run into an issue where we may not be able to get this item to you for a while, but we would interlibrary loan it for free if they wanted. Thanks. All right. Uh, we have another question. In your area, is there any financial assistance available to help customers remediate their home? That's an excellent question. And I don't know if I have the answer to that. Um, I think that there are various, I know that there are various financial assistance for low income, um, residents, but I do not know if it would be specifically for this. Um, so thank you for that question. I will look into that for my, myself. Um, I think again, our when I spoke to our health district, our public health district, they said they would come out and look. Well, they were a little like they would come out if they had the staff to do it, or if people wanted to bring items to them, they would examine them for free. There'd be no charge for that. But as far as treatment, um, I think that's one of those obstacles and why you find this maybe more with low income because it is an ongoing thing unless you can get really professional treatment done. Um, if you're living in a facility, generally the facility is going to take care of that. But if you're living on your own, financial assistance would be extremely helpful. Um, I got two more questions here. So uh, next one is, what kind of evidence did you require from a patron to show that they had taken care of their home infestation? Oh, um, that was quite a debate, I, I will tell you. Um, ultimately, what we landed on was some sort of receipt or proof that a professional treatment had been done. Um, if we faced a lot of pushback on that, um, we did reserve the right where I, as the library director, could make the call to just try to take their word for it. Um, like they would have to speak to me and we would have a conversation. And then ultimately that would end with, okay, I, I, I trust you. I believe this was done, but please know if this happens again, we will have to further block your account and it will require some sort of proof. And 
Our last question here is, once a bed bug is confirmed in the library, how long does it take on average to clear out that infestation? Wow, I don't know. Um, if you're talking in the facilities itself, I, I really cannot answer that as we did not experience it. Um, if you're talking about in the items, if they are quarantined quickly, um, you should be able to have those items pretty well cleared off within a month if you follow the, the treatment options in place. But again, if it's a household, so we had one household returned items, those items were quarantined, but then a couple weeks later, more items. So that was sort of ongoing. I think if it was reduced to one batch of, let's say, items returned in a book drop, I, I do think you could have those items cleared up and ready for patrons within a month, depending on which treatment plan you go with. Um, but that patron itself may not have their services restored in that time, depending on how long it takes them. So I'm sorry, that's a really wishy-washy answer. Problem. I, I, I do appreciate it, Janet, and thank you for taking the time here. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.